Hello and welcome to Oil Market Insight. You're joining us here on the occasion of the 168th OPEC conference. We're going to take a look at what's been happening in the oil market and joining me now, we have our analyst in place here. We're delighted that you've taken the time to join us. I'd like to introduce you to them. Jason Schenker here. He is the president of Prestige Economics. Karen Kneissel, an independent analyst. She's joining us also. And we're delighted. Derek Brower, thank you so much. The editor at large from Petroleum Economist. Thank you so much to all of you. Now, it's been definitely, without a doubt, a challenging year. Jason, we have to look at the U.S. market, and I know I appoint you the spokesperson for the U.S. market every time we talk, but um, what's been going on there at the moment? And we're looking at the Fed decision, so there's, there's a lot of anxiety in the market, but a lot of action as well. Well, there's a couple things going on. You know, the U.S. economy has been decelerating uh, in recent months. If you look at durable goods orders, industrial production, uh, if you look at retail sales, excluding autos, all of that's been decelerating. So the macro economy is slowing down at the same time that inflation is going up. So this is a risk for the Fed because they might have to raise rates, even though you're seeing, especially the industrial part of the economy slowing down. So that's not as good. For the oil side of the market, which is probably more important to what we're talking about today, uh, if you look at miles driven on a 12-month moving total basis, they started hitting new record levels since December of 2014, and they've been going up ever since. You're seeing record levels of miles driven, so that's that shows that there's kind of robust demand. Uh, and at the same time, you're also seeing the percent of light vehicles that are SUVs and light trucks. Those are well above 50%. Those have been very strong this year, and that's because you've had relatively lower fuel prices. So you are getting a demand response in the U.S. where low prices does result in more demand. So I think that, you know, from the macro demand side, that's kind of what we're looking at. Looking at America, and we're looking at the figures that are coming out of there, we've seen some oil taken off the market. But how, can, where we, can we expect more oil to be taken off in the next year? Yeah, I think so. I mean, very importantly, and you mentioned earlier the Fed, the Fed, the FDIC, which insures bank deposits, and the Office of the Control of the Currency issued a joint statement at the beginning of November highlighting how large the bad debt is for, for oil and gas in the U.S. So this means that you're going to see credit problems in the year ahead for oil and gas companies in the United States. Those IOCs are going to come under pressure. You're going to see very large CapEx reductions, and you're going to see those steep decline curves of shale kick in as and have an impact potentially in dampening supply uh, at the same time that you see additional marginal projects be really cut off. Money's going to get very tight in the United States for oil and gas in the next year ahead. And while that might balance the supply a little bit, I mean, it's going to really hurt investment. Big but also when everybody seems to realize this and people know how critical it is to invest, you know, yet the reality is if the money's not there, if the profits are not being made, you know, it makes economic sense to, to pull back. Jason, what, what can companies do right now? Well, you know, it's very challenging. And, uh, you know, I think right now companies, if, I mean, some companies have bigger, longer term projects and the aircraft carriers are already turning. They're already, the projects you can't stop. Then, then those will probably go forward. But marginal projects, they're going to pull back. Guys are going to really get very conservative. And what is perhaps even more important is that the investment money outside of corporations, so the funds, the hedge funds, investment funds, private equity, there's a lot of talk, and because I'm based in Texas, I hear a lot of this, that there's a lot of money out there when prices are low and guys are going to come in. But the truth is that I'm very skeptical about this. I've seen different things going on with funds right now. I think that you're going to see even the private equity and the hedge fund money hold back for a while. A lot of companies have been burned in the last 12 years, and they have mandates to, to hold back. I think that the belief that there's a lot of money that's going to come in real soon is a bit too over-optimistic. You're going to see a cutback in capital in the space. And that gives us a very different dynamic than it ever did before, because if the price comes back up, there's a lot of these players in the U.S., Jason, and in Canada and that almost ready to come back because they've managed to actually, a lot of oil is off the market, but they've still managed, I think everybody thought less oil um, or a lot more would be off the market. Well, so yes and no. So I think that, that while you've seen folks pulling back, I think, you know, one, once burned, twice shy, you might see folks still a little reluctant. And while 60 to 65 might be a break even for some companies mm -hmm. and different corporations might have their own internal numbers in order to attract new capital to IOCs. 
uh, you're going to probably need very attractive returns on things. So, so you're going to have to see companies are going to be doing a lot of M&A to cut costs. They're going to be doing cost leadership projects. They're going to be doing reorgs, anything they can to decost the process and also depeople on the IOC side because they need to reduce costs very quickly. If they can continue to produce at lower price points, then that might be attractive enough returns to attract more capital in. But that's what you really need to do more big projects is more capital. And I think that's going to be the, the challenge yeah, in the next year or so. Please, come in, Dave. There's a couple other things that are sort of happening in the market. One is that all those producers that were hedged at, at you know, a fairly high oil price, on the other side of that, that, it, that transaction was somebody who's, who's suddenly buying very expensive oil. They're not going to come back and do those hedges again. I mean, as you say, you know, once, yeah. once burned, twice shy. The other thing is that there's an assumption in the market that costs have come down, production costs have come down, and they'll stay down. As soon as the price starts going up, production costs will go up as well because services companies, which have been really suffering, will start to ask more for their services. And so they'll get more. Yeah, they will. Yeah. So what, we get back into this spiral again, uh, Jason? Well, I don't know how much of a spiral it, it, it's going to be. It, you know, it really depends on what the global growth outlook looks like. But I think that, I mean, our expectations are we would see modestly higher prices as you see improvements in, in, in global growth and Chinese monetary policy that, that encourages some demand growth, which is one of the critical areas um, for global demand, additional marginal oil barrels. I think that's going to be what matters. I, I don't know how big the spiral gets um, because you might have some shale producers who can quickly bring on smaller wells, but uh, you know, I, I think it might limit some of the upside from, from having a very sharp upward spiral. I just I want to wrap this up, but I want you all to sort of take a look maybe now at the longer term because I think without a doubt um, it's uh, the situation is you know the market is oversupplied. It's been oversupplied for quite a while here. Uh, the producers are dealing with that, and everybody is dealing with that as best they can. But when we look further afield, Jason, take a bit of a longer term view on this. The demand growth is definitely there. Well, yeah, OPEC's own calculations show that 71% of the oil demand growth the next 25 years is coming from China, India, and emerging Asia and that OECD oil demand growth uh, peaked in the mid-2000s. So, you know, I think if we take a long-term view of where do those critical areas of growth, where are they going, there's a lot of upside, right? On a per capita basis, uh, you know, the United States consumes nine times as much oil as China. So, you know, you don't need to move the, the needle too much to get to a point that, uh, that we've discussed here today that, you know, that, that those economies, just a little bit more oil demand uh, growth per person results in a very big change. And those are long-term things that, that aren't likely to change anytime soon. Well, we're going to have to wrap it at that. Derek, um, Karen, Jason, thank you all so much for taking the time with us. And there you see it, a very, very challenging time for the oil market at the moment as we bring 2015 to a close here at the OPEC headquarters for this oil market insight. Thank you so much for joining us.